Hi, my name is Jo Gibson and I'm a clinical physiotherapy specialist working at the Liverpool Upper Limb Unit in Liverpool in the UK and I also work as a consultant in private practice. Now if you've joined us for any of these Monday Facebook Lives before, you'll know that this is just an excuse to talk about anything to do with shoulders, share some interesting case studies and talk about some of the dilemmas and controversies that we as clinicians face every day in our practice. So if you've joined us, you'll know that we've talked about some really interesting case studies over the last few weeks, and that's certainly something I'm intending to return to um, next week with another interesting case for you to try and unravel. Um, but tonight, I'm just going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, I was asked to talk at a webinar a couple of weeks ago and was originally asked to talk about scapular dyskinesis. And then I got an email saying, oh, Joe, I hope you're all set up to speak about um, scapular dyskinesis and pectoralis minor contracture. At which point I had a bit of a kind of mini meltdown and thought, well, that isn't what I was going to be talking about. And actually, what am I going to say about it anyway? So I ended up doing a whole lot of research about pectoralis minor and I thought I'd better up, up, uh, grade my research and make sure that actually the fact that I wasn't actually paying it a lot of attention in my practice was justified um, and there wasn't anything I was missing. Um, and so really what I wanted to share with you was the latest on what's out there, whether we should be stretching it, whether we need to worry about it, what the best evidence is for stretching it, um, if it's relevant, does it tell us anything in our athletes, etc. Um, the irony was that when I did the webinar, um, one of the other guys presented a case study about somebody with a pet minor contracture, um, and I got away with just talking about scapular dyskinesis. So actually, all my panic was to no avail, but now I feel very read up on pet minor. So I thought I'd share that with you tonight, and as I say, we'll get back to some of our challenging problem-solving um for next Monday. Now, so pet, mate, pet minor, what do you need to know about it? Well, we know where it is. It attaches from our third to fifth ribs at the front and onto our, the superior medial aspect of our coracoid. And I think it's fair to say that it, most of the attention about pet minor has been in the sporting literature. Now, there's another group that we perhaps need to think about it in conjunction with thoracic outlet, and we'll come back to that at the end. But essentially, if we look at the sporting literature, there's no doubt a belief that um, patients develop asymmetry over time and that may have a potential role in shoulder pain. We have studies showing that if we measure pectoralis minor length um, before and after a training session, then it definitely reduces in length. Um, and there is also a big relief, uh, sorry, a big belief that there is a link with shoulder pain and shortness or reducing length in pet minor. Now, the interesting thing is there are reliability studies showing that we can measure it reliably. So if we use calipers um, or we use a tape measure at the front, so from the ribs to the coracoid, actually those have good intertestor reliability. The measure that really has no intertestor, well, it has good intertestor reliability, but isn't very useful in looking at pet minor length is when patients lie in supine and we measure from the couch to the shoulder. Now, there's a study years ago that said a normal value was about 2.6 centimeters, but you can imagine that anybody with a kyphosis, um, Anybody with any other structural changes is going to influence where and where, how can you tell that's pet minor or not? So essentially, that's been shown not to be the useful measure. So if you want to measure it, calipers or a tape measure seems to give you best value. Now, in terms of why do we want to measure it? Is there a good evidence base that it has some relevance, particularly in our non-traumatic shoulder pain populations? And I guess the short answer is no. Whilst it might be counterintuitive, there's a big belief that obviously if it's short, then it's going to alter the position of the scapula because of that attachment on the coracoid. But actually what the studies show is there's no link whatsoever with the acromiohumeral distance. There's no actual link whatsoever with scapular dyskinesis. There's no evidence with an increased risk of developing shoulder pain. And as we see with many things in the shoulder, if you follow up a cohort that have a shortened pet minor, compared to those that have a more normal length when you compare age match controls, there is no increased risk of developing shoulder pain in the group who test short. So that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? So the mobility doesn't seem to be a big issue. And again, what we see in sport is that length often reduces over time, but it doesn't mean people will become symptomatic. And so often what it's interpreted at is it's more about um, adaptation than anything else. So do we truly get shortness in the pet minor? Well, the studies looking at how easy it is to influence and what's um, Kevin Loudon did some studies looking at the best ways of stretching pet minor. Um, and he looked at 
therapy's techniques to stretch it, but also looked at the very common one we see with patients in 1990 and stretching it themselves. And his study showed very convincingly that actually self-stretching by the patient was the most effective way of doing it. Now, there was another study where they set up this really interesting device, which was almost like a walking stick that was pressing into the pecs as they just did a dynamic movement through range. Again, that seemed to be a very effective self-release technique. Um, the other two things that they've shown were um, doing some work on the rotator cuff, that improved pet length. And then the final thing they did was stick some tape on to give some sensory input. And again, that seemed to improve length. So I guess the question is, do we need to improve it? Well, actually, what we're seeing is very much like we see um, with something like GERD. So the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit that I've talked about on one of the Facebook lives before, we know that really is just an indication of muscle stiffness. So in somebody without a history of trauma who hasn't had surgery, who doesn't have any indication that they should actually have any capsular change in the glenohumeral joints, we know that that medial rotation and abduction when it reduces is actually just an indication of muscle fatigue and muscle stiffness. Now, it seem to be a very similar thing when we look at stiffness in the front. It's an adaptation to having done something. So if you look at swimmers who do an intense training session, if you look at throwers that do an intensive training session and you measure their pet minor length before and after, there are definitely reductions in length. But again, those things are very easily restorable, either because they've recovered from fatigue or they get their muscle system going. Now, OK, so we're saying that actually we can measure it. It does change with training, but what about looking at our influence on it over time? Now, in patients who do um, overhead sport, there have been studies looking at the effects of stretching. And the bottom line is that if you do repeated stretching as part of your shoulder prevention, then actually there is no illustration that it has any positive effect on scapular mechanics. It doesn't have any positive effect in terms of function. And actually, any change in length is temporary. Now, there's one thing just to say. There was a study looking at patients who had anterior shoulder pain. Um, they did stretching every day for a period of four weeks. And at the end of the four weeks of stretching, there was some improvement in their pain but it was only short lived. So again, it's like stretching isn't enough. And again, when we look at sport generally, it would seem that strength based or proprioceptive based interventions, neuromuscular based interventions are far more effective than looking at, st at stretching um, on its own as a standalone intervention. So I guess what we see is we've kind of very much what we see with our glenohumeral internal rotation deficit is fundamentally the stiffness that we see in pet minor, that change in length over time in relation to sport is more of a muscle stiffness issue than a true contracture or fibrosis. Um, again, it's adaptation. So we know that we tend to overuse our anterior muscles if our posterior shoulder gets tired, but equally it can work the other way around depending on the sports that we're looking at. So it would really suggest it's the victim, not the culprit. So can we forget pet minor? Do we not need to worry about it? Well, this webinar that I was telling you about, essentially um, a surgeon presented a case study where he did a tenotomy of somebody's pectoralis minor. Now, I think the key thing about this guy's history is that he had had trauma. So he'd been in a car accident, I think, significant trauma and had this really kind of prominent scapula that was being held in anterior tilt. And basically the surgeon showed a very consistent, uh, sorry, a very convincing series of pictures both when he went in and showed the fibrosis in pet minor and he released it and how much it improved the scapular position. But again, this is somebody with a clear history of trauma. So if we've got somebody who's had wrist fractures, clavicular fractures, etc., and we have associated imaging, then one could argue a case in those cases. But guys, it's incredibly rare. If you look at the literature, we've got two or three case series that are reported. So again, it makes me slightly suspicious that we need to make sure that we've ruled out all the other things. Now, those of you that maybe joined us on the Thoracic Outlet um, a podcast a while ago when we talked about neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, you might remember that we said that actually in anywhere between two thirds and three quarters of patients with neurogenic thoracic outlets, that actually it's a double crush, not only at the scalene triangle, but also in the retropectoral space. And interestingly, um, surgical series that look at patients who have surgery for thoracic outlet have suggested more consistent um, outcomes when they address both 
both a release at the Spleeny Triangle and they do a pet minor tenotomy. Now, again, I'm always much happier when there's a kind of cause and effect. We know there's a higher prevalence of thoracic outlet in our hypermobile populations and more represented in females. But equally, if you look at those patients who tend to do better with surgery, often they've had some history of trauma as well. So palpation over that um, pet minor, over its insertion and reproducing any of those thoracic outlet sim symptoms is definitely something that a vascular surgeon would now take on board because those surgical series definitely seem to be supporting that addressing it, particularly in that post-traumatic population, has a good evidence base and does seem to improve outcomes. Now, there's one other thing to say when I was trawling through looking at um, evidence for pathology specifically affecting PET minor is there are some case series looking at PET minor tendinopathy um, in a weightlifting population. So this is specifically in weightlifters. Again, no great surprise. They had tenderness over their coracoid. They had some anterior chest pain. A lot of their pr provocation um, was on bench press. Um, but again, it's very much almost looking at it as a diagnosis of exclusion, most commonly with anterior shoulder pain, particularly in terms of load and lifting, then you'd be ruling out your long head of biceps or any local response in your AC joint in terms of osteolysis. But it, I think it's interesting if you do look um, at... Um, this bench press population. And again, it seems to be people who are bench pressing over one and a half times their body weight. There is a case series um, presented of patients with a localized tendinopathy. Now, most of them did well with rehabilitation, again, addressed to their rotator cuff and some emphasis on their thorax. Um, a small group needed to go on um, actually to have uh, an injection. But again, that seemed to give them a good therapeutic effect. Um, just back to the thoracic outlet gang for a minute. Sorry, one of the things I forgot, there's actually a guy called Ollie Donaldson, who's a surgeon down in Somerset. Um, and he actually does an initial intervention using botulinum toxin on pet minor in patients with that neurogenic thoracic outlet. And um, particularly when um, they reproduce their symptoms on palpating pecs in terms of giving them their peripheral symptoms and their paresthesia. Now, interesting, it's only a small series, 17 patients, but five out of the 17 patients actually got full resolution just using Botox. So just switching that muscle off temporarily was enough then to let rehabilitation do its job. But in the other 12 patients, when the botulinum wore off, if their symptoms came back, then they did a pet minor tenopsomy. So there's some quite interesting things happening around that thoracic outlet syndrome population. I think pet minor tendinopathy, if you actually look for it in the literature, is very rare. There's only two papers looking at small case series. But again, just something to be aware of. I guess the key thing I just wanted to say tonight, having been asked to talk about um, pet minor um, stiffness and stretching, um, was really whether I was doing something wrong because it's not something that figures highly in my um, management. And to be honest, it's not something I actually assess. I'm always looking at how I can change things in terms of either using my symptom modification, um, obviously educating my patients, but also looking at the thing that's problematic to them. So I think it's, it's something to be aware of. But again, in terms of sports, if you're working with sporting population, adding stretching in doesn't, based on the current evidence, seem to give us any additional benefit. So that was just a quickie, really, because I'd had to do all this research and had a look at it. Um, I was just keen to share that with you. Um, so just got a question from Marlene here saying, can you let me know when the thoracic outlet talk was? Um, I can actually post the, in fact, I can't do that now. Sorry. Let me just get back onto there. That was a silly thing to do. Um, what I will do for you, Marlene, is I'll actually post it on the Facebook page, um, because I was actually looking at it earlier today. Um, there's all sorts of, um, it's, it's definitely worth a listen to, um, mainly because it was based on a masterclass that I did, um, organized by the Thoracic Outlet Center of Excellence. Um, and it was a real insight into where things are to help you with your diagnosis. Um, and I'll also post a link to the Royal College of Vascular Surgeons recommendations for diagnosis, because again, it's a really lovely synopsis of the things that make you confident to make that diagnosis. Um, and again, in terms of that pet minor and some of those things you can do. Now, when they talk about pet minor and they talk about ruling in that double crush, it's important to say that doing the local injections actually is only um, successful in about 80% of patients. So as ever, it's putting the whole story together. Um, but I'll do that for you, no problem at all.
Now, guys, you've been very kind to me tonight. We haven't got lots of questions, so it's uh, definitely going to be a shorty tonight. Um, as ever, this was just a kind of update, really, on where we're at with Pet Major. And as I say, it's like many things in the shoulder. We've tried to hang our hat and find the thing that give us, gives us the best bang for our buck. I think the key thing with any of these things, whether it's scapular dyskinesis, whether it's pet minor shortness, whether it's our GERD, our glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, as standalone measures, they don't really seem to be terribly useful. However, where they're getting a lot of attention is change. So if you do a training session, it gets shorter and then you don't recover or you don't put some... Um, what's the word? You don't put some measure in place to ensure that your athletes um, recover in terms of fatigue and restore it to their normal. If you get a change over time, at what point does that become pathological? And actually, if we stop that happening, can we reduce injury rate? As I'm sure you know, the biggest thing about injury is always load and overload and spikes in load and Tim Gabbard's fabulous work about acute and chronic workload. But I think what these things are useful for is they're all things that we can measure very easy clinically and monitor in terms of change and important look at the efficacy of our intervention with getting that muscle system working. Um, I won't be adding pec stretches to my interventions for my non-traumatic shoulder pains anytime soon. And remember, even if you want to stretch it, the evidence suggests that the patient doing it themselves is more effective than you helping them away. So I hope that's given you a kind of update on pet minor, um, some things to be aware of, some slightly unusual things, which was interesting about the uh, tendinopathy and that thoracic outlet group. And as I say, I'll definitely post the link to that uh, podcast. Um, it's packed full of information. So guys, thanks so much for listening. Next week, we're going to come back with another interesting case study. Um, you're going to do your detective work and see who can get the answer first. Um, get your brains thinking. It's been good fun seeing um, how well everybody does actually in guessing what they are. I'm going to have to start making them harder. Um, but as ever, thanks so much for joining this evening. I will post those things right away as soon as I finish. Um, and for now, I will look forward to seeing you next Monday. Thanks again for joining and see you all again very soon. Bye for now.